welcome everyone. Um, nice to see uh, so many people here. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, for me to, to introduce and chair uh, today's speaker who, um, well, this was one of the, one of the small benefits of COVID, if there are any, that we do, uh, we are doing our virtual seminar and um, we obviously get to draw speakers from a much larger uh, range than otherwise the IHR would be able to afford to uh, do. So it's a great privilege to introduce um, Professor uh, Eric Goldberg, who today is coming to us uh, from, from, well, from his home, I think, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, so Eric is an Associate Professor uh, of History at uh, MIT. Um, Many of us will know him from his uh, excellent book on Louis the German, Struggle for Empire, um, which was uh, a much needed uh, fresh look at, at the Eastern Frankish Kingdom in the ninth century. Um, Eric has a new book which uh, has just come out. Sorry, I actually didn't look at the date. It's either just come out or it's about to come out, is it, Eric? Um, and his new book uh, is called In the Manner of the Franks, Hunting Kingship and Masculinity in Early Medieval Europe. And uh, Eric has been kind enough to share with us a flyer, um, which I think Alice is going to pop into the uh, chat, uh, the chat box now. So everybody should be able to um, see that. And uh, yeah, I can see it now. And on that, Eric has uh, shared a 20% discount um, and, and uh, some other information uh, about the book, um, which has been published by um, Penn, uh, University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, and uh, we all look forward to having a look at that. Um, unfortunately, I haven't, um, don't have a copy yet, but do very much look forward to, to reading that soon. Uh, so Eric's paper today doesn't, I don't think necessarily pertains to hunting, but um, perhaps there's a bit of hunting in there, perhaps, um, I'm, I'm not sure, but, but um, it, it comes out of a project, a new project that Eric's working on, uh, on the later Carolingians and uh, the Vikings. Um, Eric is working on a, a new translation of, of the text in, in question that he's going to be talking about, uh, which is the Annals of Saint Vast. And I think you said, Eric, that you were going to be publishing this along with some other uh, sources from, uh, from the period, um, which uh, sounds very exciting um, and, and much needed. So um, the paper uh, title um, is, uh, er Eric's paper's title is uh, slightly changed, I think, from what, was, what we had originally, um, but I've got here that it's uh, Eyewitness to the End of the Carolingian Empire, Author, Argument, and Audience in the Annals of St. Bast. Uh, and just to let everyone know, just before we get started, um, what will happen with questions is uh, we'll have Eric's paper, um, and uh, after, after the paper, um, the chat box will open. Um, and so the way we'll do Q&A is basically, if you want to ask a question um, in the chat box, uh, just say either your name or you can, you can write, raise hand, or I have a question, that kind of thing. I'll keep an eye on it. Um, and um, I'll, I'll keep an order of sort of what, what, what I see in there. Um, and um, this, and, and, and yeah, this will be the easiest way. I think we're not able to use the, the raise hand feature because of the number of people in here. So uh, um, I think that would be the easiest way for us to do Q&A uh, at the end. So um, without further ado, um, Eric, if I can hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks to Alice Rio for inviting me to speak uh, at the earlier Middle Ages seminar uh, at the University of London. Uh, and thanks to Ed Roberts for that really nice introduction. Uh, it's a real honor uh, to be speaking to you this afternoon um, and talking about a project I've recently begun about the late Carolingians. Um, so I look forward to hearing your, your questions and comments uh, afterward. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, okay, so the, so um, the title of my my uh, my talk today is "Eyewitness to the End of Empire: Author, Argument, and Audience in the Annals of Saint Vast." <clears throat> uh, on March eighth, nineteen sixty seven, the German historian Heinz Löwe gave the plenary lecture at the annual meeting of the Monumenta Germaniae Historica and the Historical Commission of the Bavarian Academy of Sciences. 
An expert on the written sources of early medieval history, Leuve chose as the topic of his talk, the writing of history in the late Carolingian age. In this paper, which offers the only existing survey of Carolingian historiography date, Leuve surveyed the range of survived historical works, annals, royal biographies, ecclesiastical and monastic histories, uh, hagiography, uh, from the Treaty of Verdun in 843 to the early 10th century. Leuve argued that, the late, that late Carolingian historiography fundamentally differed from the historical works of the reigns of Charlemagne and Louis the Pious in that it betrayed a creeping pessimism about the destiny of the Carolingian dynasty and of the Franks as the divinely chosen rulers of Europe. He concluded, and here I quote, our survey of historical writing of the late ninth century confirms a picture of a realm externally threatened and internally shaken and undefended, of disappointment over the weakness of kingship and to a great extent also of the nobility who alongside great deeds could rightly be accused of much failure and self-serving abuse of power. From such comments, one sees that some authors, despite their Christian faith in God, contemplated the inevitability of decline, die Unabwendbarkeit des Niederganges. For Löwe, therefore, late Carolingian uh, writers of history faithfully reflected the times in which they wrote. The Frankish Empire after the Treaty of Verdun was locked in a process of political decline and the chroniclers of the period revealed this painful historical truth in their works. More recently, scholars have revised considerably Leuve's assumptions about the extent to which late Carolingian historical works accurately reflect the Unabwendbarkeit des Niederganges. The trailblazer in this revisionist scholarship was the University of London's Janet Nelson, who took on the star eyewitness for Carolingian decline in her classic 1985 article, Public Histories and Private History in the Works of Neithard. In this landmark publication, Nelson demonstrated how Neithard's four books of histories, which dramatically recounted the Carolingian Civil War after Louis the Pious's death, was deeply influenced by Neithard's own traumatic experiences. His increasingly dark picture of Carolingian political and moral decline therefore was not objective historical reportage, but rather a deeply personal account shaped by his own evolving career and hardships. Inspired by Nelson's work, historians have penned similar studies of other late Carolingian authors. Nelson herself on Hinkmar of Reims, Stuart Early and Simon McLean on Regano of Prum, uh, Ed Roberts on Flodoard of Reims, and Micah de Young on Radbert of Corby. While not denying that late Carolingian Europe experienced important political transformations, these scholars demonstrate how the specific circumstances under which authors wrote deeply shaped how they recounted past events. Modern historians Therefore, cannot simply mine late Carolingian chronicles for historical facts without taking into account authorial intentions and preoccupations. At the same time, this scholarship calls our attention to the fact that these authors wrote for reading publics of literate laypeople, men and women, as well as churchmen, and sought to influence them through their historical narratives. In other words, late Carolingian historians both responded to and sought to influence their precise historical contexts and audiences. In my talk today, I would like to attempt a similar approach to a vital yet relatively neglected late Carolingian chronicle, the Annales Vedastini or the Annals of St. Vast. Spanning the years from 874 to 900, the Annals of St. Vast provides one of the very few eyewitness accounts to the last decades of the ninth century and the momentous breakup of the Carolingian Empire in the year 888. We do not know the identity of the author, except that he was a monk from the West Frankish monastery of St. Vast, located in the city of Arras, about 100 miles north of Paris. 
uh, here indicated on the map of the West Frankish Kingdom. The author's dramatic narrative focuses on two main topics. First, uh, the conflicts among rival kings and magnates, and second, the depredations of the Northmen. One of the most striking aspects of the Annals of St. Vast, or the AV as I will call them, uh, is its pervasive ominous tone. Notably, the author employed chilling and even shocking language to describe Norse raiding and violence. In the year 879, for example, he depicted the Northmen, quote, hungering for burning and destruction, thirsting for human blood, and aiming at the extinction and destruction of the entire kingdom. Later on, he describes how, quote, corpses of clerics, laymen, nobles, and others, women, youths, and infants lay in the streets. There was no road or place where the dead did not lie. For Lova, this menacing tone and defeatist mood accurately reflected the dire political circumstances of the late ninth century. The rapid succession of short reigning kings, the growing disunity of the Franks, their inability to mount effective resistance against the Northmen and the inexorable collapse of the empire. So in my talk, I aim to problematize Loewe's approach to the AV that takes its depictions of late ninth century decline at face value. I would like to suggest that the author's picture of the late ninth century was deeply influenced by his own specific circumstances and experiences. Here, I build on the important scholarship of Philip Grierson, Simon McLean, and Stefan Patzold who have noted that the monastery of St. Vast stood on the front lines of the political and military struggles of the late ninth century. As Simon McLean put it, our chronicler was writing at the sharp end of Viking hostilities, and we therefore should not assume that his account of events was always objective and without exaggerations and distortions. Today, I will expand these insights and address three interrelated topics. First, I will discuss what we know about the identity of the author and the unusual political circumstances of his monastery. Second, I will explore the central preoccupations and arguments he wove into the fabric of his chronicle. And third, I will conclude with a consideration of the audience for whom the AV author wrote. So uh, let's begin with the author of the Annals of St. Vast and his monastery. Like many Carolingian chroniclers, he wrote anonymously. He was a brother at the monastery of St. Vast in Arras, which he affectionately described as Monasterium Nostrum. Uniformity in style, language, and grammatical idiosyncrasies points to the conclusion that it was a single author who wrote the chronicle. Some scholars, including, including Heinz Löwe, have speculated that the chronicle, as we now have it, may be incomplete. I think this is unlikely, however, and I will explain later why I believe we have the author's entire text. He seems to have written his annual entries relatively soon after the events he described, although his occasional telescoping of events shows that he sometimes finished his reports the following year. The rather low quality of his Latin points to the conclusion that his formal education was somewhat limited. Bernhard von Simpson, the editor of the 1909 MGH edition of the AV, described his style as crude and inelegant, ebenso barbarisch wie einfremdig. The AV author frequently made grammatical mistakes in verb tenses and noun cases. The exact meaning of his Latin is at times unclear, and he repeated certain turns of phrase. His literary quotations come exclusively from the Vulgate translation of the Old Testament. Nevertheless, he was a keen observer of politics and war, and he painted a vivid and even dramatic picture of the tumultuous events he described. His historical outlook was that of a Christian. 
He referred to God's role in bestowing military victories and defeats, and he believed his monastery's patron saint, the early sixth century Bishop Vedastus, protected the city of Arras and its citizens. It therefore is notable that he never referred to miracles. In his view, it was the deeds of kings, nobles, and prelates that drove historical events, although he ultimately believed that they, these events were the outcomes of God's will. Uh, it also needs to be emphasized that our chronicler's historical perspective was profoundly local. While he noted events in Aquitaine, Burgundy, Italy, and East Francia, he focused primarily on the region around Arras itself. That is the West Frankish royal heartlands between Paris, Reims, Flanders, and the sea. Although he wrote primarily at St. Vast, it has been overlooked that he apparently took refuge from the Northmen in the city of Beauvais during the 880s. Um, let's see. He reported that in the year 880, all the people between the Scheldt and some rivers, that is the region where Arras was located, took flight from the Northmen, and that the following year the Norse attacked and burned his monastery and killed everyone who had remained there. Several years later, he lamented that all of St. Vast's precious objects, its treasures, liturgical vestments, books, and charters, were destroyed when the Northmen burned the city of Beauvais in 886. This information points to the conclusion that the monks of St. Vast, including our author, took refuge in Beauvais between 880 and circa 887. Uh, and as you can see from my screenshot from MapQuest here, uh, I like to imagine that they rode their bikes to get to Beauvais. The fact that our author referred to specific events in and around Beauvais during these years supports this conclusion. But he had apparently returned to St. Vast by 888 when he described how the newly crowned Odo, the first post Carolingian king of West Francia, celebrated Christmas at his monastery that year. Our author and his monastery therefore had suffered first hands from the raids of the Northmen, and that should make us cautious about overgeneralizing the scale of Norse destruction based on these graphic reports. In addition to Norse attacks, another factor had a major impact on St. Vast. Since 843, the monastery had often been ruled by lay abbots and used as a bargaining chip in the ongoing power struggles between West Frankish and Lotharingian kings. In the Treaty of Verdun, Charles the Bald granted St. Vast to his brother Lothar I, which made the monastery an extraterritorial Lotharingian enclave within the West Frankish kingdom. And I think these maps don't quite get the don't quite get this right. Um, St. Vast was actually outside of Lotharingia, and, but it belonged to the Lotharingian king. It was within East Fran uh, West Francia. These maps show them as territorially contiguous. 23 years later in 866, Lothar II gave St. Vast back to Charles the Bald in return for Charles's support in his divorce controversy. Charles held St. Vast as lay abbot for the rest of his reign, as apparently did his son, Louis the Stammerer. Hinkmar disapprovingly reported that Charles the Bald divided up St. Vast's lands, keeping the most important villi for himself and giving others to his supporters. At the Treaty of Ripmont of 880, Louis the Stammerer's heirs were forced to give the monastery once again to the ruler of Lotharingia, this time the East Frankish King Louis the Younger, in return for peace. After Louis the Younger died in 882, the monastery yet again reverted to the West Frankish kings. Between 883 and 892, it was held by the deacon Rudolf, a relative of the powerful Count Baldwin II of Flanders. During Rudolf's abbacy, Charles the Fat fortified the monastery of St. Vast and the city of Arras. 
the fortification of St. Vast and Arras in circa 887 was a significant event in the history of the monastery, and it reflects the growing strategic role of fortresses in politics in war in late 9th century West Francia. St. Vast now became a strategic fortified center on the contested West Frankish Lotharingian frontier. And the AV author henceforth described his home as a castrum and a castellum garrisoned by Castellani. After Abbot Rudolf died in 892, a violent struggle erupted for control of St. Vast. And this conflict dominated the last nine years of the AV. The author narrated the frequent sieges of St. Vast and its changing of hands between different rulers, including Kings Odo, Charles the Simple, and Sventibald, Counts Baldwin II and his brother Rudolf of Vermandois, and Archbishop Folk of Reims. Indeed, the chronicle concludes in the year 900 with the shocking murder of Archbishop Folk by a vassal of Baldwin's amid this ongoing conflict over St. Vast. In short, our historian was anything but a disinterested and objective observer. He was a monk whose monastery had suffered greatly at the hands of both Northmen and rival kings and magnates. The annals of St. Vast reflect the very personal concerns, experiences, and hardships of its author. So I now am getting to the second part of my talk, which is looking at the, uh, the, the argument of the author in, these, in this chronicle. So historians have traditionally quarried the annals of St. Vast for historical facts about the last decade of the Carolingian Empire. What they have not done is read the text as a conscious work of historical literature written by an author with his own concerns, preoccupations, and arguments. I would argue that our author, in fact, articulated a central theme that unifies his entire chronicle. This central theme is the topic of discordia, that is conflict among the Franks and their rulers and the negative consequences of that discord. Discordia was the enemy of effective kingship, which depended on political consensus between the king and nobles. As Horst Lösslein uh, put it in his important recent study of the period, quote, successful kingship depended on the ruler's ability to integrate the nobles into a process of collaboration, to mediate between their and his own interests and to create consensus. To appreciate this central theme of discordia, we need to consider for a moment the important question of when our author, when our author actually began writing. Years ago, uh, Reinhold Rao pointed out that the author based the first five years of the Chronicle, that is the entries for the year 874 through 878, on the contemporary annals of St. Bertin, which was written by Archbishop Hinkmar of Reims. Uh, and I will return to this question of how the AV author might have obtained a copy of Hinkmar's um, Annals of St. Bertin at the end of my talk. In any event, the fact that our author based his first five years, that is 874 through 878, on the Annals of St. Bertin is important because it points to the conclusion that he did not begin writing uh, the AV until 879 when his annual entries become original. In other words, he apparently began writing his chronicle in 879 and at some point backdated it to 874 by summarizing events he found in Hinkmar's chronicle. The realization that the annals of St. Uh, Vast Monk began writing his chronicle in 879 is highly significant because two key political events happened that year. The premature death of the West Frankish King Louis the Stammerer, as well as the death of the powerful Count of Flanders, Baldwin I. Indeed, the consequences of these two prominent deaths in 879 and the political conflicts that ensued shaped the entire chronicle. The author repeatedly used the word discordia 
as well as the related as well as related terms such as dissensio, in imicidia, and odium to describe the resulting conflicts. This discordant theme is an ominous leitmotif that runs, I'm sorry, is an ominous leitmotif that runs throughout the rest of the chronicle. The author introduced this topic in his opening passage for the year 879, which as we have just noted, uh, as, just, as we have just noted, is his first original entry. And here I quote his opening words. In the year of our Lord 879, Count Baldwin died and was buried in the monastery of St. Bertin. King Louis, the stammerer, became seriously ill and ended his days on the holy day of preparation, April 10th. After his death, a miserable and ruinous conflict, miserabilis et excidiosa decensio, broke out among the Franks. For Hugh the Abbot, remembering the oath of fidelity he promised to his cousin, King Louis, the stammerer, along with those who agreed with him, wanted to establish his sons, Louis III and Carloman II, in their father's kingdom. But Abbot Goslin of Saint-Denis, Count Conrad of Paris, and many others who sympathized with them summoned to the kingdom King Louis the Younger of East Francia. While they were fighting among themselves inter se discordantes, the Northmen located across the ocean heard of their conflict, eorum audientes discordiam, and sailed over the sea with an infinite multitude. So here the author articulated the central theme of his entire chronicle, that it was the discordia among the Franks and their kings that caused both the political turmoil of the late ninth century, as well as the invasions of the Northmen. Especially noteworthy is the causal relationship he postulated that it was the news of the Franks' conflicts, Aorum Audientes Discordium, that brought the Northmen from England and Scandinavia to the continent. In our author's eyes, therefore, Frankish discord and the breakdown of political consensus, uh, excuse me, in our author's eyes, therefore, Frankish discord and the breakdown of political consensus were the ultimate causes of the destructive Norse raids. The arrival of the Northmen in Francia brought about a practice that our author repeatedly condemned, and that is the payment of tribute. Throughout the work, he criticized kings and bishops who paid tribute to different bands of Northmen in return for their departure. In an important 1999 article, Simon Copeland argued that tribute payments, in fact, were an, eff an effective short-term strategy Frankish rulers employed to deal with Norse armies. While I find Copeland's arguments persuasive, our St. Vast monk adamantly did not. He argued against the payment of tribute repeatedly, and he did so for two main reasons. First, he believed that tribute payments showed a reprehensible lack of courage and faith in God on the part of the Franks. And second, the tribute, which often amounted to thousands of pounds of silver, was partially raised from churches and monasteries, including St. Vast. The AV author believed that such plundering of churches, spoliatio ecclesiarum, offended God, who in turn punished the Franks by allowing further Norse victories. This explains the, the author's notable praise for bishops and abbots, such as Goslin, who fought the Northmen and refused to pay tribute. In contrast, the author repeatedly presented the payment of tribute as the proximate event before the deaths of rulers. In this way, he implied that the alarming rate of royal deaths was, at least in part, the result of God's displeasure for the ransoming of the kingdom. For example, he described Charles the Fat's payment of tribute in 887 to the Paris Vikings as a truly wretched plan, concilium nimis miserum, that precipitated the final breakup of the empire. Immediately after reporting Charles's payment of tribute, he added, quote, seeing that the emperor's strength for ruling the empire was weak, 
the East Franks cast him out of the kingdom and placed his nephew Arnulf on the throne of the kingdom. It is said that Charles, after losing his empire, was strangled by his own men. The Northmen, in their usual way, ravaged all the places up the Meuse River and in part of Burgundy." End quote. In the eyes of the A.V. author, therefore, discordia among the Franks led to a catastrophic downward spiral. Norse invasions, payment of tribute, divine anger, more Norse destruction, premature royal deaths, and ultimately the breakup of the empire itself. This central focus on discordia and its dire consequences dominates the remainder of the author's narrative. It therefore provides the backdrop for his account of the reign of Odo, who ruled the West Frankish kingdom from 888 to 898. Odo was the leader of the powerful Frankish Robertian family, the ancestors of the Capetians, and he, began, uh, and he became the first post-Carolingian king of West Francia after Charles the Fat's death. Immediately after describing Odo's coronation, the AV author identified the three leaders of the Discordia against him, Archbishop Fulk of Reims, Count Baldwin II of Flanders, and Abbot Rudolf of, of St. Vast. The identification of Rudolf as one of the leaders of this conflict, Primi Huius Discordiae, uh, is significant because it, uh, this is the St. Vast author's first mention of his own abbot. Rudolf was a deacon, a member of the Frankish Unraking family, the son of Eberhard of and the son of Eberhard of Friuli, and between 883 and 892 he held the abbacy of Saint Vast as well as of Saint Bertin and Sisuang. While identify, uh, by identifying Rudolf as one of the leaders of discord, the chronicler impugned his own abbot, which, which suggests that the monks of his monastery were divided in their political loyalties. He went on to narrate how Odo's opponents in 893 crowned the 13-year-old Charles the Simple, the last remaining grandson of Charles the Bald as counter king. In the words of our author, they elevated the young Charles to the throne to spread animosity and hatred in Imikidia et Odium against King Odo. This long tale of discord and hatred culminates in the very last entry of the Chronicle, which describes the events of the year 900. Odo had died two years earlier and on his deathbed, he named Charles the Simple as his heir. In early 900 at a royal assembly, a heated argument erupted between Baldwin II and Folk of Reims over possession of St. Vast. As retribution, one of Baldwin's vassals ambushed Archbishop Folk as he returned home and shockingly murdered him. The royal notary Heraveus was chosen as Folk's successor at Reims and Archbishop Heraveus immediately called a synod that excommunicated his predecessor's killers. The final lines of the Annals of St. Vast conclude with yet another outbreak of discordia. During another royal assembly, a supporter of Duke Richard of Burgundy made an insulting remark about Odo's surviving brother, Count Robert of Paris. The final line reads, quote, when this was reported to Robert, he got on his horse and returned home. And with everyone quarreling, omnes discordantes, they all departed without achieving anything. This concluding comment ties off the dark thread of discordia that runs throughout the tapestry of the Chronicle. It echoes our author's very first original entry, which reported how the West Frankish nobles began fighting among themselves, inter se discordantes, when Louis the Stammerer died in 879. This thematic continuity from beginning to end points to the conclusion that the Annals of St. Vast as we have them is not an incomplete work. Rather, it seems to be the finished product of an author who from start to finish argued that Frankish discord 
was the root cause of the invasions of the Northmen, the suffering of the people, and ultimately the end of empire. The bright counterpoint in this theme of discord is the chronicler's depiction of King Odo himself, who is the one ruler he consistently praised. When describing the Viking siege of Paris in 885-886, the AV author introduced Odo as the illustrious count, Odo Illustrious Comes, who in the absence of effective leadership from Charles the Fat, heroically defended the city. After Odo became king, the Saint Vast Monk consistently presented Odo as a ruler who sought to reach settlements with his adversaries through peaceful means, through acts of mercy, temporary truces, negotiated compromises, renewed oaths of fidelity, and alliances of friendship. Some historians have interpreted Odo's use of more horizontal bonds of amicidia with magnates as a sign of a new kind of post-Carolingian rulership in which rulers, in which kings presented themselves as first among equals. There may be something to this, but the Saint Vast Chronicler presented this dynamic as a key aspect of Odo's royal mercy and aversion to conflict. A key passage comes from the year 895, when Odo captured the fortress of Arras and St. Vast, which was being held by supporters of Baldwin II. And here I quote again from our chronicle. King Odo then surrounded Arras and the fortress of St. Vast with a siege. But having mercy on his fellow Christians, he did not want to capture it by waging war. Seeing they could not resist him, Baldwin's men sued for peace, handed over hostages to the king, and sent messengers to their lord Baldwin so that he could tell them what to do. The king ordered the gates to be opened. He entered the monastery and fortress and went to the church of St. Vast, where he prostrated himself on the ground before his tomb, prayed most devoutly, and wept profusely. He also heard mass and gave thanks to God. Baldwin's messengers then returned and carried out the things that their Lord had told them to do. Immediately, the king commanded that the keys of the castle be returned to them, and he ordered all his men to depart and that Baldwin's men receive back the fortress. The king then announced to Charles the Simple's faithful men that there would be an assembly after Easter so that they could pass the winter without discord. Sine discordiis. So I've quoted this, this passage because it sums up the author's positive picture of Odo. He portrayed the first Robertian king as the enemy, not of his adversaries, but of Discordia itself. Through his mercy, his desire to avoid bloodshed, and his willingness to compromise, Odo sought to end conflict and reestablish peace. He apparently was the Joe Biden of late ninth century politics. Especially noteworthy is the author's emphasis on Odo's personal piety and humble devotion to his monastery's patron saint. There simply is no other depiction of royal piety like this in the entire chronicle. In this way, the author used the figure of Odo as the embodiment of royal virtues that he saw as necessary to restore the war-torn kingdom. Our author drove home this message about the devastating consequences of Discordia through his use of literary quotations from the Bible. Scholars have ignored the use of scripture in the AV, although it is central to the author's overarching message. The chronicler's quotations come almost exclusively from the Hebrew Bible, the book of Judges, Samuel, Chronicles, Judith, Ezekiel, and Maccabees. Significantly, these quotes derive from passages that narrate the ancient kingdoms of Israel and Judah, their civil wars between each other, and their struggles against foreign invaders. 
For example, when describing the Discordia and Norse plundering after Louis the Stammerer's death, the author quoted from Judith 228 and Judges 2024, which describe respectively the Assyrian invasion of Israel led by Holofernes and a bloody civil war among the tribes of Israel. In this way, the author implied that the tumultuous events of late 9th century Francia with the strife among rival kings and pagan invaders was a replay of the history of the ancient kingdoms of Israel and Judah. The biblical uh, echo that the author employed most frequently was the phrase, they laid waste with no one opposing them. Nemine sibe resistente wastawerunt. The author used this phrase on eight separate occasions when describing the Franks' ineffectual defenses against the Northmen. Bernhard von Simpson interpreted this formulaic rep repetition as a symptom of the author's limited literary ability. But this does not tell the whole story. The phrase, they laid waste with no one opposing them, comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 28 which describes the reign of David's wicked descendant, King Ahaz of Judah, who was the father of Hezekiah. This passage narrates King Ahaz's ruinous wars against the peoples and kingdoms surrounding Judah, the Arameans, the Philistines, the Edomites, as well as the kings of Israel. Notably, Ahaz sought an alliance with the Assyrian king, Tilgath Pelezar III, but this strategy backfired and the Assyrian ruler invaded Judah. Ahaz therefore had to pay tribute to Tilgath Pelezar with treasure he took from the temple and his subjects, but this angered God further. As a result, the Assyrians laid waste with no one opposing them. This biblical refrain, therefore, was an essential part of the author's critique of Frankish discordia and the payment of tribute to the Northmen. Through it, the author drew a comparison between the current state of Frankish politics and the reign of the wicked King Ahaz. The lesson was that the Franks needed to end their conflicts, honor God, and cease paying tribute to restore peace and divine favor. So I, I now come to the third and final section of my talk uh, when I want, where I want to address the question of audience of the Annals of St. Vast. Um, the surviving manuscripts of the Annales Vedastini uh, suggest primarily a local circulation of the work. And I want to give a disclaimer here that I still have some, some work of my own to do getting a handle on the different manuscripts. And, and uh, so this is a preliminary assessment uh, of, of the manuscripts. But the two earliest are two 10th century copies that are today uh, in the Bibliothèque Royale in Brussels. Uh, one manuscript uh, 3108 uh, probably was copied at St. Vast itself. Uh, and the other manuscript 3109 was copied either at St. Vast uh, or at St. Bertin nearby. Uh, moreover, in the early 11th century, the AV was copied wholesale into two later historical works. Uh, the first one was a universal chronicle uh, known as the Chronicon Vedastinum uh, that was composed at St. Vast. And the second is the Annales Vobienses, written at the Lotharingian Monastery of Lobs. Based on the manuscript transmission, therefore, it seems that the AV reached an audience primarily uh, in Northern Francia, in Arras itself, as well as in uh, nearby St. Bertin and Lobs. The text of the AV contains further clues about audience. To begin, it is clear that the author assumed an informed political audience, since he seldom explained the identities of the individuals he mentioned. The fact that the author uh, 
the fact that the author referred to St. Vast as Monasterium Nostrum and focused on events in and around it reveals that he saw his fellow monks as an important readership of his work. As already mentioned, uh, he was critical of Abbot Rudolph, which suggests that there were different groups of monks with different loyalties within the cloister. Yet his audience almost certainly went beyond his monastery. For example, he vividly described the conflict that broke out in the city of Arras when Abbot Rudolph died in 892. He identified different political actors within the city at that moment, including the military garrison, the Castellani, uh, the local Count Edgefrid, who was uh, loyal to King Odo, as well as a supporter of Baldwin II uh, named Everbert, whom he criticized as extremely crafty, nimis versutissimus. Such passages reveal that the fortified city of Arras contained uh, different socioeconomic and political groups, including soldiers, citizens, monks, nobles, and supporters of different uh, political factions. Our author probably hoped that some of these people would read his work. His simple Latin style would have been accessible to a wide range of readers and listeners. The ending of the Annals of St. Vast uh, may give us a final clue about another possible audience. As we have seen, the final entry described the elevation of Heraveus as the successor of Archbishop Fulk of Reims. Before his elevation, Heraveus had served as a notary at the courts of Odo and Charles the Simple. He was a member of the powerful Unraking family and his influential relatives included St. Vast's own former abbot Rudolf, as well as the local Count Huckbald of Salis, who had been one of Odo's chief supporters. As a well-connected member of the royal court and a relative of Abbot Rudolph, it is likely that Heraveus visited the monastery of St. Vast uh, and perhaps even knew the AV author personally. This possibility combined with the fact that the chronicler concluded with Heraveus's uh, elevation to the Archbishopric of Reims suggests that he hoped Heraveus also might read his newly completed work. Ed Roberts has pointed out that Heraveus later was a patron of the future historian Flodoward, which might suggest that the prelate had a personal interest in history. Moreover, a connection between the AV and Heraveus of Reims would help explain how the author obtained a copy of Hinkmar of Reims's Annals of St. Bertin to serve as the basis for his first five entries for the year 874 through 878. The Annals of St. Vast would not have been an inappropriate work of history for the new archbishop, who through his, through his elevation had become one of Charles the Simple's chief counselors. In the Annals of St. Vast, Heraveus would have found an interpretation of West Frankish history that explained how since the death of Charles the Simple's father in 879 and Charles the Simple's posthumous birth that same year, Discordia had dangerously undermined the peace and stability of the realm. Yet in the figure of Odo, the St. Vast chronicler offered a portrait of royal virtue, piety, and mercy that a counselor like Herveus might urge the young king to emulate in order to rebuild political consensus in the war-torn kingdom. In the end, it can't be proven that our monk intended the Annals of St. Vast to be read by Archbishop Herveus of Reims. What is clear is that he wrote his chronicle not simply to record for posterity the tumultuous last decades of the Carolingian Empire. Instead, he sought to organize those momentous events into an interpretive narrative that could teach important historical lessons to a diverse readership. A readership that included fellow monks in the monastery of St. Vast, citizens and soldiers in the fortress of Arras, Frankish nobles beyond the walls of the city, and perhaps even counselors at the court of the king.
Thank you.